hell is a colorway? Do I want this? Is Linux compatible with easy anti-cheat yet? Yeah, nerd. I'm sorry that like the webcam doesn't look very good. Um, it's good enough. So I'm just going to be looking at chat over there. If I put it over there, I might have less distance to look at. Um, so yeah, I just opened up Firefox. Get Linux. I don't want... Alright, so this is going to be a bit of a stream, and we're going to be talking about Linux. Um, and it's going to be kind of a casual chat. What version of Linux? Um, any version. We'll uh, get into that. I guess now, um, but first, let me explain what Linux is. Um, so Linux is an operating system. Um, if you search up Linux and you find out that you can't use the internet, then you figure out you've probably failed at pre-stream checks. Oh my God, what's happened? Is my internet down? So these are the kind of issues you'll hit with Linux right away out of the bat. Things just sometimes don't work. And that's okay. That's part of the Linux experience. Um, so we shall figure that out in a minute. I'm using libvirt for my virtual machine stuff. So it is possible that I've somehow really, really ruined my life because I don't know how to use this tool properly. Um, let's go down to, what is it called? Network interface? Um, no, we're going to be using the NAT um, device for this. And let's go back to the console. Is that going to work or will I need to reboot the machine? Anime game. What is anime game? Uh, let's just shut this down. Is that like squid game? So right now we're actually booting up Ubuntu Mint. No, not Ubuntu Mint, Ubuntu Mate. Um, but let's search up Linux in Firefox and I hope it works this time. I put sound on, but I'm pretty sure no one wants to hear the sound. See if crab game works on wine? What's crab game? All right. Yes, please restore my session. Here we go. So if you look at Wikipedia's entry for Linux, you'll find that it says it's a family of open source Unix like operating systems. And this is kind of useless to know about what Linux is or why people like Linux. Like no one's going to go, I like, well, maybe some people, but no one's going to go, I like Linux enough because it's an open source Unix like system that I'm going to start telling people on stream to use Linux. Like that just doesn't make sense. And that's because a lot of the reason people like Linux is not because of the tech reason. Um, it's kind of a social thing. So, probably the first part is it being open source. Um, I can click stuff properly. Get a postcard from Asia? No. So, Linux is open source software, and that has some technical definitions about, um, you know, how you can use it, what you can use it for. Um, but that kind of just misses the point entirely, at least in my point of view too. Um, the point of open source that I see is ownership. Um, when you get a piece of software that's open source, um, it's yours um, as much as it is anyone else's for the most part. Um, now that doesn't particularly mean anything. What happened to Juki or Juki one? We don't know. So that doesn't particularly mean anything material, but it does kind of put in place the kind of sociological effects you'll see around the Linux community. Um, 
because without the concept idea of a central owner of Linux and free and open source software, for the most part, um, you get really weird and not weird. Um, you get kind of an exciting community based around projects that people are working on that they enjoy working on. And naturally, if they stop enjoying working on them, usually what will happen is another project will pop up or a project will diverge into multiple projects. So Linux tends to end up as a, a catch all for the family of operating systems that have kind of diverged and mixed up um, based on what people actually want, their disagreements, their political views. Um, so I want to really look at it in that perspective in that when you think of Linux, you should really be thinking about um, the communities behind it, because if you search up Linux and we go to um, here, unlike Windows or any other computer operating system for the most part, uh, let's scroll down, you shall see that there's too many Linux distributions, or well, there's too many, there's too many of everything in Linux. If I can find the, uh, we might have to search up Linux distributions, list of Linux distributions. You can see a giant graph of here of, did I click that? Yeah. Let's go through this graph a little bit. Just make it a bit bigger so we can actually read it, please. talking about Nazi shit? No. So I have to zoom out a little bit on this. Around 1992, you got the first Linuxes, you know, Slackware to be in early 90s. And then you have all these other ones. But what you can see is that whenever there's a disagreement on how things should be run, um, you get a fork. So Slackware, someone's like, I don't like the way Slackware is doing its thing. So they made um, SUSE or SUSE. And that actually, I think that shows up later um, as the open SUSE. Yeah. SUSE, SUSE, and that forks into uh, Magica and SUSE Linux and open SUSE and then EasyNAS. And in Debian, if we go down to, go up to Debian, this is one of the longest Linuxes. Yes, Dr. Seuss. Let's zoom in a little bit. If you look at Debian, it starts off and then it continues going to this day. But like every, every year, every minute, every second, there's a new fork of Debian. Because people just can't agree on things. And then like Ubian that was forked to Ubuntu down here. And that has its own whole bunch of stuff. And there's also Red Hat and basically there's a million families of Linux. And you will probably be looking at this and thinking, what is the best Linux? Which one should I try? And the answer is that it might be any of these for you. Um, and that's because it doesn't matter really what the software is. It matters what the community around it is. It matters the purpose of the distribution, the Linux, if you will. Um, who is controlling it? What for? You should make your own distro first thing. I could. Um, because, well, I'll get into that in a minute. But if we go to distrowatch.com, you can see that there's like new distros all the time. Is there a distro coming out? Yeah, uh, Voyage Alive is an Ubuntu based distribution um, with French language support. What's cool about Voyage Alive? Let's see its sales pitch. Um, if you go down here, you can see some things about it. Um, you can see that it has some things. Um, I think if you scroll down, 
if we look at a particular version of it, I think Voyager Live 11, if I click that, is it going to show me about the actual version? I know DistroWatch has a way to figure these things out, um, like a list of what software is in which, what, in which version, but uh, I just can't find that at the moment. So let's go to their website. It's a Zubuntu base. Oh no, here we go. So I clicked Voyager and we see all the versions and we see all the different software versions and that's pretty cool. Um, but let's go to the actual website and see what this is. Why would I want to use this? What's the sales pitch? Um, an infinite and varied Linux operating system. It respects your privacy. You are no longer a product. You like Voyager Live. You can make donation. donation. Um, lots of inaccessible pictures as text. So you still don't know much about what this is. Like this is the same as every Linux distribution. So what you have to do then is find the community behind it. Um, you can kind of see that they have different versions of Voyager here. They have Ubuntu based and Debian based and then one for the tablet PC and gaming based, Cyberpunk 27, 2077. Wow. There's a lot of stuff going on here. More security, donation. Contact them. Like the first question you should have with any distribution is why does this exist? Let's see, community. And this is how you can kind of, forum is closed, oh no. Um, was that open before? Oh no, is there a community? Let's search up Voyager Linux some more and see if there's like some reviews or something. Um, one of the best Linux distros you've never heard of. Hey, it might not be something amazing. It might just be someone's spin on it. It looks like it's uh, just meant to look a little more user friendly than usual. That's okay. But one thing you can kind of get is that this is not an uh, distribution that's purely English, which is nice. It seems to have USA, German, Italian, Korean, Spanish, and French. And that's fantastic to see. It's always good to see new Linux distributions, I think, because it means this person has been unsatisfied, all these people with other Linux distributions, that they've decided, I'm going to create my own. that there's no distribution out there that fits me properly. In fact, it's kind of amazing seeing just how many variants they provide. Forum Zubuntu. Is it based on Zubuntu? I'm not sure. So we don't see much information about this distribution. I guess we could look at the comments. I mean, it looks like they're getting donations. So who knows? Let's pick a more popular um, distribution. Let's search up Ubuntu. And you'll see you get a big cookie notice that we're trained to click accept. Hope no one's going to pop that up and ask me to like install a virus or something because I'll definitely click accept then. So here you can see Ubuntu and it, it right away, you can kind of get a feel for who Ubuntu is for. Um, enterprise, developer, 
as a little community thing over here with some tutorials. Um, apparently SQL Server is available on it. Modern Enterprise Open Source blog, and that's all about networking. Um, they're hiring, yeah. You know, open source security, that's pretty good. Now, let's look at an Ubuntu derivative like uh, Linux Mint. And it's going to be almost basically the same with a different, you know, coat of paint. And what does it, what, what is its uh, goal? Uh, not loading, apparently. Whoa, are they okay? You okay, Linux Mint? Buddy, holy cow, rip in peace, Linux Mint 2006 to 2021, huh? Damn. Blah. Let's scroll down a bit more. So we're not going to be looking at Linux Mint. I guess we could look at the archive page of it. Let's do that. They got the kit. Yeah, the Linux wars are strong. There's been manual, many casualties. Uh, a lot of page captures. I wonder why. Oh, Wikipedia links. So yeah, this is what Linux Mint's website looks like. It's uh, it's an older website. It's green. It is green. Um, from Freedom came Elegance. It has some sponsors over here. It has a little blog. You can donate. You can participate. Let's do that. Uh, if you go about, go about Linux Mint. If I can click that. And it says the purpose of Linux Mint is to produce a modern, elegant system and comfortable operating system, which is both powerful and easy to use. So you can kind of get the idea that they're trying to make something that's, you know, user friendly and aimed at people. It says it's community driven. That's pretty cool get involved, donations, helping others, and you've got forums. How's my trackball? <laughs> I guess you can figure that out. Um, so you have forums and you have this community here around Linux Mint. And that's pretty cool. That's what makes up Linux Mint. Um, while with Ubuntu, it seems like canonical, the corporation behind it makes it up. Snakeoil-os.net, is that a real link? It is. So, this seems like satire. But I'm not sure. It seems like a Linux for audio files. But they named it Snake Oil OS. That's pretty cool. Let's look at the uh, forums, huh? And it's giving me an ad. That's nice. Hell, there's a lot of stuff here. Let's look at testimonials. And let's see what people say about Snake Oil OS. Um, the gold standard IMO, a breath of fresh air. See, I don't know what any of this means, but people seem to like it. It seems to have solved their issue. Now, is this a Linux? 
If you cannot pronounce the word Linux, then Snake Oil OS is the perfect solution for you. And so what this probably is, is I'm guessing it's a Linux that's meant to go on audio stuff. Not too sure, but people seem to like it. Oh, supported hardware. Hey, Coz. Snake Oil is a specialized OS with a custom built kernel. Um, so Snake Oil OS is a Linux that's designed to run on specific um, digital audio, con uh, not digital audio converters, machines that have specific cards and configurations and stuff. Um, and that kind of brings me to one of the main points of Linux is that uh, specialization happens a lot more than you would see in Windows or any other kind of closed ecosystem. LVGL.io. See what this is. Open source graphics library. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's nice. I like that. But let's get back to Linux. Linux, Linux, Linux. So you can see there's a lot of diversity in Linux and a lot of communities that kind of make their own Linuxes around, around the kind of goals that they want. And this isn't really possible with Windows, is it? Or Mac or whatever, because you don't really own these systems. Um, if you search up Windows distribution, you're not going to get anything. Well, you get the, you know, clear the software distribution thing that happens when Windows update breaks. But with Windows, there's only kind of one solution. You know, Windows 10, Windows 11, and they go on your desktop computer. They're not going to, they're not intended to be made to run on your audio equipment. Hey, Co-Gamer. Hey, Coz. It's the Linux podcast. So to kind of push this point home a bit more, Linux can run on systems that Windows will never run on because Microsoft just, you know, they haven't decided to put it on it. And while systems, people like Linux Mint and Canonical also don't run on these systems, because Linux is open source and the ownership is kind of shared around, you can run Linux on, say, an Odroid N2. Little Linux boards. You know, these don't run Linux. Uh, these don't run Windows, they run Linux. Very, very fancy. Why would you want one of these? Or maybe you'd use them for a home theater. Maybe you'd use them as an emulator system. Cos uses this as a micro server. He runs a little, um, I think he runs a web server on it and maybe just a file server or something or a NAS or whatever. But this is something that, you know, he would not be able to do without Linux and without the community surrounding it. Web server and NAS and XMPP. Um, and so this is kind of where I get to the point of why I like Linux. Um, because it's not a single, wow, I just loaded all my DOS stuff up. DOS stuff up. Um, it's not a single operating system or set of packages that are meant for a single uh, solution. It can be made into basically anything for any hardware. Like uh, there's even crazy situations where people have been putting Linux on uh, systems without memory mapping support. Uh, no MMU. Like what the hell? This isn't good. This isn't possible. Linux is one thing that, you know, 
Unix's one thing is that it's like an actual operating system that requires memory mapping, uh, virtual memory. But some people were like, I don't want to run anything else. Or rather, I want to run a full system on my, I don't know, microcontroller. It has enough memory and you know, I don't want to just run any system. I want to run Linux and benefit from the community and stuff. So I'm going to port Linux to system without memory mapping. Yeah, it is pretty neat. And you'll see this basically everywhere. So Linux is a bit, Linux, the Linux community is a bit like a bacteria. Um, it'll spread, it'll spread everywhere. And it kind of mimics a lot of the kind of human political views and disagreements, which is a lot healthier, I think, than having a system that's just owned by one corporation or one person. Uh, which kind of, you know, there are open source solutions that are kind of run by one system, one per, uh, person. And a good example of that was OpenOffice. Um, this... If I can even find the Wikipedia page for this. OpenOffice was open source, but it was owned by Oracle. And this is the same thing as MySQL and stuff. And it kind of stagnated really hard. It stagnated to the point that the Linux community, community actually made a fork of open office and shipped that in all their systems instead of shipping actual open office. Um, they shipped this thing called go -O -O with all their patches on top of it. And eventually they got so fed up with Oracle, um, they forked open office and go -O -O into LibreOffice. And then Oracle threw a bit of a shit fit and forked Oracle open office into Apache open office. And that's kind of dead. And you're probably saying to me, like, why are there no variants of LibreOffice? And I think that's, well, there, there is, there's NeoOffice there. Um, guess who's still here? Apache's software goes to die, is where software goes to die. Kind of, yeah. Um, this whole diversity thing doesn't seem to really happen on the kind of micro level. Uh, more on the distribution level, and that's usually because in Linux, all the software that makes it up is from different people instead of a single vendor. So things can be swapped out or changed. And for the most part, all of them share the ability to interoperate. So if you don't like LibreOffice, you could probably just use another Office suit. Well, with operating systems, it's mainly about, you know, the out of the box experience and what a system can do, which is why they're called distributions. Apache software is all basically shit that's dead. Um, a little bit. I run a, I run the Apache HTTP server on my, uh, on some systems I do. But I think I run literally proof it's old junk. Wow. Um, In Nginx is pretty cool. It's open source. And, you know, people have been like, wow. Oh, sorry. Nginx. Uh, Nginx is a little bit old. Not old. Uh, Nginx is, it's pretty cool. But people have forked it to be called Open Resty, if Wikipedia has a page for that. And uh, it has extra stuff, and it's tailored for other things. Yes, Open Resty is a fork of Nginx, Nginx, whatever you want to call it. And instead of having it scripted with configuration files, they put a Lua interpreter in it. And you can use Lua to run little things in your web server without calling out to other things. And you can like do uh, lots of interesting things with it. Um, 
And that's despite Nginx and OpenResty being two different commercial systems. They're still open source and they still benefit from each other. And if things go horribly bad, the community can still kind of, you know, exert ownership over it. They can make their own fork. Uh, because the code is open source. Is Wikipedia run on Linux? Um, yes, Wikipedia is run on a LAMP stack, I believe, which is, if we search up LAMP, and we go to the nerd section, no longer. Uh, let's search up Wikipedia backend. Wikipedia technical. They had a big post about it. What do they use now? I know at, at the very least they run PHP and MySQL to run their open source media wiki software. Which is pretty cool. Media wiki is, you'll see media wiki a lot in like, well, any place you'd kind of see a wiki. Um, well, there's lots of other alternate wiki software. Is that why Wikipedia is so fast? No. Um, in fact, often, well, not in the web sector, but often Linux is worse for the solution. Like, if you were to switch from Windows to Linux, you'd have a bad time for the most part because Linux can't run your Windows applications for the most part. Uh, Linux can't do the things that you probably want to do. Um, there's always work being done on that to make some kind of compromise using things like Wine. Should you use Windows? If you want to run Windows programs, use Windows. Uh, but the Linux software and ecosystem tends to also, you know, spread into Windows. Like LibreOffice runs on Windows, Firefox runs on Windows. Um, I think Apache, like this whole LAMP stack here has been ported to Windows. Like if we go to variants, you see, uh, you know, you can run it on Windows called WIMP or WAMP. In fact, I used to do that as a kid. I would do web development, you know, just toying around stuff. I would do that by installing WAMP on, uh, on my Windows home computer. And then I could have basically the same tools that, you know, real data centers and stuff would use. And that's kind of like, if we're going to take the idea of ownership of Linux, um, and, you know, Linux and the open source community, um, and how it kind of spreads to fill use cases and stuff, uh, one of the primary reasons I really push hard and use Linux and open source is because it really lowers the barrier to usage and education and learning. Um, if you want to run something like, uh, if you want to develop for, for Windows, if you want to develop for Mac, you have to go through a process of buying components, um, testing them, uh, using their tools, spending a lot of money, spending a lot of time and effort learning these things, going, you know, probably buying books and courses. Um, well, with Linux, it almost seems like it wants you to use it. Um, you know, it's free, uh, in price. And that's a good thing, I think, because it means that anyone can use it. Um, it really drops the barrier for, um, socio, socio, uh, economic barriers. Like buying a Windows computer, if you want to run Windows 11, you have to buy a new computer, basically. Um, that's a lot. Where if I wanted to run a Linux, I could say I could buy a Raspberry Pi computer. Um, and then I could just put whatever Linux that supports it on it. And there's cheaper systems than a Raspberry Pi. Um, if I search up, you know, 
Raspberry Pi Zero or an old ThinkPad. Yeah, it's very affordable. In fact, you know, you can buy like old, you know, quad core systems that aren't really usable with Windows or Mac or whatever these days. Um, you can buy them for around $50, like a complete tower, and then you can set up Linux on it and you can use your computer to do things that, you know, Linux and open source can do. You can use it to learn how to operate web development, do embedded programming, um, do some light gaming. You have an old EEPC as a microserver? Yeah. So, you know, one could look at it as, looking at it as, you know, we turn e-waste into things that will just work. But I really do like to think of it as this kind of, you know, Linux is growing to fill the needs that people have, real needs. Um, and systems like Windows just don't. And you see this everywhere. Um, well, Windows can now run its version of Linux. Microsoft have their Windows subsystem for Linux too. Which should probably be called Linux subsystem for Windows, but, you know, I'm not going to die on that hill. Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, 11 Australian dollars. You need the power thing? Probably like, I don't know, but you can run Linux on this. Linux is very financially accessible. And once you learn a bit of Linux, you can take it to bigger systems and other systems, your skill set transfers. So if you spend some time using a Raspberry Pi Zero and you set up a little web server, you can take those skills and move that web server to like the cloud with you know, Linode, not sponsored, but just like they're the first one I can think that has, you know, easy set up Linux. Um, while with Windows, Mac, um, a lot of things, there's just this huge, huge barrier. Like I have a laptop over, over there. It's a ThinkPad. It runs Windows 10. It can't run Windows 11. Um, and it's just a big headache for me because you know, I'm stuck. I'm stuck with it. I can't put, I'd have to spend a lot of money to kind of go up from where I am there. While with Linux, you can kind of go as high as you want or as small as you want. Um, you don't have to run it on your desktop. You can run it on whatever. You can run it on your Odroid Go Advance. Can you run Pokemon on Linux? Yeah. I could buy an Odroid Go Advance here and it would run Linux. And uh, of course, this kind of brings me to the point of where, uh, where Linux and open source kind of succeed is exactly in the places where there's a lot of uh, corporate red tape to work around. Like, would you ever see Nintendo or Sony or um, really any kind of high stakes commercial company sell something like the Odroid Go Advance? Um, probably not because it turned into a shit fest simply because it runs things like emulators. I mean, this could probably play DVDs, which is still a forbidden art. If you want to play DVDs on Windows, um, the only thing that can really offer you that is money or open source solutions. By having that ownership made communal, there's a lot uh, less risk because uh, if an emulator or something gets sued out of oblivion, then people are just going to fork it and move on. You know, there's, that's just how things work when it spreads. I should probably get one of these one day. Like, I think it has Wi-Fi. That's pretty cool.
what else is there to say about Linux? Basically, I think that's the main points about Linux I wanted to make. If you made that on a stream, you'd be hyped. No. Um, so that's mainly the reasons why I run Linux, um, because it's not going anywhere and it's always going to kind of expand and fit use cases that um, I need it to be. Um, not just Linux, but it's software too. Like uh, if I can open up a window without opening up a browser tab, a, a private tab, you can things like, see things like home theater, um, Kodi, this is open source. It ran on an Xbox at first, but because it's open source, it didn't just die and it's ended up running on Linux and Android and now it runs emulators and games. And you can download Kodi, you can run it on your system right now on Windows, Linux and Android. And it's pretty great. I had a set top box that ran this and it was pretty good. And I will probably try and set it up again sometime. Um, the only reason I stopped using it is because the micro SD card in it died and, uh, I don't know. I didn't want to replace it. Maybe I could turn it into a web server. Who knows? That could be a good stream to do. Um, routers run Linux. My home router runs Linux. That's pretty cool. Um, open WRT. This is a community that, you know, packages a special version of Linux, just a distribution that's just set up for routers. You know, it's meant to be small. It's meant to do router stuff. You can put this on your router and things are fine. You can install extra packages for it. It's great. Um, there was a big disagreement over it. There was a lot of upsetness and anger and they forked. They forked to OpenRC and uh, OpenRT and Libra Elect. No, not Libra. Libra ELC? No, Lead. It forked to Lead for a few years because people were pissed off. And then it merged back. That's pretty cool. Um, and again, that kind of represents that what you'll see with Linux and open source um, is generally the kind of chaos you'll see in most communities, except people are able to kind of act on it. They're able to make actionable changes um, instead of just being upset about stuff. And that's a big part of why I use Linux and open source, because I know that while it doesn't necessarily mean that my needs will always be fulfilled, um, it means that, you know, on average, I'm going to have a better time being able to use Linux to do what I want as a tool or open source stuff. Um, I can use LibreOffice. Do I have it in this virtual machine? Yeah, I can use that. I can send a document um, to people with it and they can use it with their LibreOffice. And while it's not Microsoft Office and it doesn't do the things that Microsoft Office can do, you know, people can use this while I can't use Microsoft Office uh, on my machines, mainly because I don't have the money for it. And that's just really important. So let's look at actually installing a Linux and look at what Linux is. Let's try and take something apart. You know, it's good to talk about what Linux is and why it is, but we should probably look at, you know, how it actually ends up being, you know, in practice. So we're going to just do what a person would do if they're new to Linux. We're going to search up install Linux. And we're going to get a million options, um, including ExpressVPN, because that's everywhere. ExpressVPN is like a virus more than a bacteria because I don't want it. Yet it follows me everywhere. 
Um, let's just go with, I guess there's Ubuntu desktop. Uh, what is a good newbie Linux? I said I should search. So Linux for new users. Um, best Linux distribution for new users. Let's go to linux.com. This is written in 2014. Um, and it says Ubuntu and Linux Mint. So let's try Linux Mint. Um, the website's up. Great. Um, what is Linux Mint? for desktop and laptop computers. So it's not for like a Raspberry Pi or anything. Um, it lets you do things pretty cool. Everything's supposed to work out of the box. It's community centric, which is great. I really like that. Um, has some reviews here. So let's download the latest recommended version and we shall install it. Um, and of course, because it's Linux, we get different versions of every single distribution. There's three flavors. What flavor do I want? The most popular version is Cinnamon. It's slick, beautiful, and newer features. There's Mate or Mate. And it's a continuation of Gnome 2. Um, people really liked GNOME 2, and then when GNOME 3 came out, people forked GNOME 2 into Mate, which is what's actually running here now. That's why it looks a little kind of retro-ish with the toolbars. Then there's the Exfus edition, which is lightweight, and that's probably would, what you would want for old laptops and machines. So let's go with Cinnamon. Let's click Download. And we're going to grab a torrent. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think, because this is the virtual machine I'm going to install it on. I might have to add a quick drive for, um, for USB drive to write to it. So let's go add a new device, 20 gig uh, disk device. Yeah. Uh, Finish. No more available PCI slots, buddy. Uh, let's try again. I think USB host device. Oh shit, I can plug an actual USB into this. One second. I have an actual USB. Let's install Linux on a USB. Um, let me plug it into my computer. We're doing it. Um, so let's in, let's add a USB device. Um, and I think it's is it even showing up? Hang on a second. Perhaps it can't be added on those buses. Um, I guess I'll replace my solo key with it, huh? Um, one moment. I have a solo USB key that I use for security stuff. But we shall replace it with this flash drive. So let's go add device, USB host device. And it's not there. And I bet that's because this is a USB 3 drive. So let's grab a USB 2 device. USB 3 pass through in virtual machines isn't really done much. Here we go. There's my flash drive. Does it have anything awful on it? I'd hope not. Just old stuff, um, used for Windows 98 or whatever. Hello, Aria, what's up? We're gonna be installing Linux. As you can see, I'm actually running this in a virtual machine and that's mainly because I'm okay with 
well, not because I'm okay with, but I'm not okay with screwing up my real system. And virtual machines are convenient. If you download a virtual machine, like uh, VirtualBox, you can just run Linux in it. That's pretty cool, right? You know, you don't need to run it on an actual computer. One hour, 55 minutes, 39 minutes, 28 minutes, 23 minutes. Um, let's just see. This is probably going to take a little while to install, uh, download. Um, torrents are pretty good because they max out your internet connection. Um, so if I get any stuttering, just tell me. Nice. I love torrents. Torrents are usually used for like, uh, put it on turtle mode because I just saw my stream buffer. Um, set it to, we're not going to do any upload. Sorry, I'm going to be a leech and we're going to do only two megabytes downloading a second. And let's see how that goes. 28 minutes. That's okay. Let's see if we can put it up a bit higher. You'll seed for me. Um, let's put this up to 3000. I think it was the upload that was killing me. Yeah, we can wait 15 minutes, can't we? We can talk more about Linux. I should probably have done this at the start. But, uh, you know... Set to one ambit. Look, you don't know how bad my Australian internet is. I know you have fiber. Lucky. I think COS has fiber. Yeah. I have fiber to the curb, which basically means, you know, fiber to the curb is such a scam. Um... I mean, it's an improvement, I'm not going to lie, but fibre to the curb, you know, basically bandwidth, the bottleneck is going to be the weakest link. And if you're running copper from the curb to my house, that's what's going to define how fast I get as a speed. Like, not the rest. So, copper sucks. Yes, it does. So, let's talk about the other part of the Linux community, um, the support for it. If you like, if something breaks in Linux, you'll, there's two ways to get support. Um, the first way is to just Google the error message. Linux is fairly transparent when it has an error. If you search up Windows update error, um, you'll get like very opaque error codes like this, like Windows, Windows updates, error, you know, 8,007-04422. And I guarantee you that the solution for all of these is always going to be run repair, check for corrupted files, um, you know, delete your software distribution folder, run the troubleshooter. Oh yeah, restart the services. Um, disable IP version 6. Disable networking services. Are we going to get to the part where it says to... Oh yeah, update your drivers. Usually it's like... Uh, I guess that's to do with a networking error. Let's look at the windowsclub.com. Yeah, let's see. We get this error. Clean the Windows cache. Run Windows Update Troubleshooter. Run in a clean state. Download and install the update manually. You know, you never find out what the actual error is or what's causing it. You know, what if it's a bug in the system? You know, you don't know. So, with Linux, when an error happens, you find a log of it. So 
In Windows, you'll enable your login background to be a slideshow and it will brick everything. Yeah. So let's simulate having an error in Linux. Um, and in fact, the other stream, I did have an error in Linux. There's a file called .x session errors and it was really big. How big is it today? 12K, that's good. But let's search that up. Let's search up accession errors, um, huge size. And we can immediately see some results um, preventing it. How do we prevent it from being that size? Am I pressing the right key? to open tabs in the background, I guess not. So Bunsen Labs is one distro. If you want to stop to stop the log file from growing too big, make a script with this code and put it in your auto start. And it removes the last 100 lines. If it gets bigger than 100, remove all of them but that. Um, then other people have other solutions. There's always a ton of solutions for a single problem, which seems to be the opposite of Windows and possibly Mac, where you have one problem and a million solutions. But with Linux, you seem to have one, sorry, one million problems with, uh, sorry, what is it? A million errors with a few solutions, where on Linux you have a million, um, one error with a million solutions. Can I limit the size? Log rotate should be able to do that. You know, daily cron jobs. There's a lot of solutions. Android is based on Linux, so you're most likely already using Linux. I don't... Uh, see, when someone says you're using Linux, like the kernel, um, I think that's a bit of... I don't like that because there's no real Android community, is there? There's no uh, real, you know, there's a million dist, uh, ROMs, or well, not, there's dozens of ROMs of Android, but they're all still just Android. You don't like see um, radical changes based on disagreements. Um, for the most part, Google is the thing that decides what can happen with Android mostly because they run Google Play services and stuff. While with Linux, there's no real restrictions on what applications you can run. Um, so the other way to get help in Linux is to look up help on a Linux forum, um, which you can probably see here. But if we go to the Linux Mint forum, linuxmint.com, um, links, forums, um, there's beginner questions, hardware support, non-technical questions, chat, don't go to the chat, there's just, that's just anything, any, any community, don't just go to a chat. So beginner questions, do I need to run antivirus on Linux? They have a whole bunch of these. Um, someone is telling me that Chrome OS has been out selling Mac OS. Um, I was, I'm in an internet argument at the moment about the year on Linux desktop, which is a bit of a meme. And people seem to measure it by um, not the community running Linux, but by the fact that somehow people are accidentally running Linux, like um, the Steam Deck, um, which I don't think is exactly what we want, right? If you have a Steam Deck, is it going to have the same kind of diversity and community as, you know, regular Linux? Maybe, um, but it's still built around a single corporation that controls um, the system. So let's see. Beginner questions. 
Um, clean and reuse USB. That's a good one. We might need that now. 75 years old, virtually no memory. The purse, not the USB stick. So how do I clean it? They want to run FDisk, which in DOS is format or whatever. So this person says to use Linux USB formatter, and that there's um, a GUI and they show some instructions on how to do it. Um, so they say to use USB stick formatter. Uh, you don't need to re reformat the stick. Right click on the ISO file, make bootable stick. That's something that happens in Cinnamon. Um, let's see. Um, the person uh, has not tried any of the solutions because uh, they're busy, I guess. Let's see if they figure out how to use it. So they used this uh, link. How to format USB drives in Linux. And it does use the terminal. Um, it has multiple methods. There's a terminal, there's the disks, there's the format stuff. Um, so that's pretty cool. I guess we're gonna have to pick one of those when we install um, the system. Chinny Minimon. Um, and then people show their solutions. And so this is where, this is another reason why I like the Linux community, um, because, because there's so many ways to do something, you're going to have so many people giving different solutions, which can be a bit confusing, but it's also a form of accessibility because one solution might not work for people. They might not be able to fully understand it or grasp it. Um, another solution might work. Linux, so easy a senior with poor memory can use it. I don't know. Um, my dad uses Linux. He's one of the people that got me into Linux. Um, he's trying to learn the command line now and that seems to be going well. Um, but I think Linux is working better for him, uh, probably because of all this. He can find a distro that he likes an interface that he likes that fits with how he thinks about the world. And, you know, when there's an error or something, he can find support for it online. And with Windows, when there's an error, I think you have to, again, try and, you know, like as a disclaimer, I often fix Windows machines and it's a fairly normal process. You just check through things um, it's basically like being a system administrator. Um, but you never drill down to like the core issue, uh, which kind of sucks. It's more like, uh, not maintenance, but kind of just, you know, the other day, my brother's windows machine, uh, broke. So we just had to reinstall windows. And I know there's probably like a way to not have that happen. But uh, there just wasn't any support for it. Like it was a really old version of Windows. The error was fairly opaque. It was a Windows update error. And all the solutions online we tried and it just didn't work. And, you know, I'm a fairly technical person. Um, but it's not because I wasn't technical or non-technical. It's just because the knowledge to fix the issue is owned by Microsoft and they don't want to share it. Windows slash 10. What? Okay, so this looks like it's downloaded, I think. Um, let's remove it from our torrents. Um, and then we'll just write it, I guess. Go to Downloads, Linux Mint Cinnamon, and let's open it with Disk Image Writer. Yeah, we're gonna write it to the USB. Yeah, let's do this.
it's Linux time. So that's going to take two minutes or so. And this is using the GNOME disk um, uh, thing. Thing. Program. And GNOME comes from the GNOME project. So if we search up GNOME, GNOME, I think it's called, we have a Linux desktop environment with its own set of applications and stuff. And the operating system that I'm currently on with my um, virtual machine is, I think it's Ubuntu Mate. Um, and it runs on Raspberry Pi 2, which is pretty cool. But it runs the Mate system. Um, it's also green. Yeah, green is a fairly popular color, it seems. Um, but as you can see, it, it mixes GNOME software in too. Um, if you have a keen eye, you can probably spot this because GNOME 2 has like toolbars and, you know, a window title there that's like blue. While with GNOME 3, like it has a whole bunch of icons and stuff in the window title at the top. Um, which is pretty great but you just get a whole bunch of, you get a kind of mishmash of a whole bunch of stuff uh, when you're using Linux and it's great. Um, I mean, it's inconsistent and it will drive you crazy if you're trying to theme Linux. Um, but there are people that work on theming Linux. That's probably something to talk about too. Uh, Linux has themes or at least most systems have, th uh, most environments have themes. There's a controversy GNOME developers don't want you to be able to theme their applications for a lot of reasons. And things like Mate do like it. They do let you uh, theme things a lot. So we can change the background to be green. We can change the theme itself. Um, we have all these different uh, versions and colors. We can customize it. Um, we can pick it to be like, uh, if we go to Redmond for the controls and WinME for the border. Um, I don't have any kind of Windowsy icons, but I can make my pointer bigger. That's pretty cool. Um, it's a lot of fun. Get more themes online. That's pretty cool. You know, I love it. Okay, I don't love these window titles. Let's put it back to, did I save a preset? It wasn't this one, but it was something else. And again, being able to theme things, as we see with GNOME here, you know, you can't do it on in certain systems, but you're going to be doing it in some systems and you just have to find the system that's right for you. And unfortunately that does mean that there's downsides, like a lot of systems aren't right for people. Um, a lot of systems don't support like screen readers. That sucks hard. There's only a few distributions that support screen readers and other assistive technology. And I've, I've been mad at that for a long time. And I'll still be upset at that. But I think that's not just a Linux issue. That's an issue of society at large. Which are they? Okay, so Pop OS, I think Ubuntu Mate and Arch Linux have good screen reader support. Um, we should probably talk about Arch Linux. Arch Linux is kind of like a do-it-yourself Linux. So you install Arch Linux and then you start just following its manual and then you install like desktop environments and stuff. It's, uh, it's fun. 
I would recommend playing with Arch Linux if you want to understand how a lot of Linux stuff works under the hood, um, especially if you want to become like some kind of system administrator. Um, for the most part, a lot of the instructions also work on other distributions too. Um, because it's just, you know, messing with software and stuff. Restoring disk image, 67, 68. We're getting there. I've done something weird to the controls and now they don't look right. That's theming. So we're about an hour and 14 minutes into it and we've talked uh, into this stream and we've talked a lot about, I guess, the societal benefits of Linux. Um, why you would want to use Linux. Well, not why you would want to use Linux, but um, benefits of Linux as a community. Um, you probably already benefit a lot from it by running open source programs. And I know I'm mixing the two terms, but, you know, they're intertwined. There's not that big of an open source community for Windows. Um, and that there is probably a place you could try Linux. You could try Linux to make a uh, game console, a little web server. All kinds of things. It doesn't have to be on your desktop. Um, but because I'm kind of a uh, nerd, I run Linux on my desktop and only really use programs that work on Linux. So I'm going to take a quick break and I shall come back to install Linux. I'm back. Let's install Linux now. The main reason I'm going to be installing Linux is just to kind of talk about it and show it off. We have our Linux Mint USB here. As you can see, it's kind of a... Um, well, it's a USB image. It's got some stuff in it. Not really that useful to us. Um, I think I should be able to set this to boot from USB. Let's go to boot options, enable boot menu, and we want to be able to... Well, first of all, let's turn it off. Uh, let's shut down. Now, installation this way only really happens in, uh, I've smudged my glasses. It only really happens in desktops, usually in like, uh, other systems, like the ones I've shown you earlier, like ARM systems, usually installed Linux the same way, but instead of to a USB drive, it goes straight to an SD card and then you just put it in the machine. But, uh, we won't be doing that today. Um, let's see, boot order. Can this boot from USB? That would be a good thing to think about asking, wouldn't it? Can QMU boot from USB? Uh-oh. Trouble. Don't worry, though. I have a solution. Um... Let's see. USB, that's not there. Okay, so let's add a USB host device. Let's add the flash drive. Is it still there? I can't see it. Already in use by other guests. No, okay. Uh, storage. What's LUN pass through? I don't know what that is. Is that what I want? Only valid for block disk. Okay, hang on. So, I'm sorry you can't see what I'm doing. But I think I have to just pass through the flash drive. Um, 
as a block device. Um, Skizzy LUN 2. Okay, so I'm just passing through a Linux block device straight through to the VM, and that should work. Escape for boot menu. Oh. Huh? I No, yeah, that's it. I think that's it there. Number two. That's not the USB device. That's just the block device. And so we have a screen here for our boot menu. Um, and it looks kind of retro. Let's scale this up. If we can. Always. So we have start Linux Mint. We have start incompatibility mode. Boot from local drive. So that's if you just want to continue booting. Memory test, hardware detection, integrity check. Ideally, you should run the integrity check first, but no one does. So let's start the next mint. So it's booting from the USB. You can see you get a little, uh, you get a little, is that spinning slightly? Yeah. You get a little logo while it boots up. Um, sometimes you'll see some text. Linux can be chatty like that. Um, can I switch between terminals here? I can do it on my desktop, but not on, uh, not here. It tells you hello, yes. Anything on the serial console? Nope. Let's get back here and just wait. Sometimes Linux involves waiting. What's your favorite moment waiting for Linux to, to work, chat? Do I want to see a bunny? Sure, what's the bunny? Yeah, I'm not putting that on my stream. Okay, so now it's put this text back up. This was the text that showed up earlier. Um, but now it seems to be booting. Here we go. We've got a little cursor. And we've got a big scaled screen. Let's not scale it right now. And this is our little Linux Mint system. Um, it's not installed yet. Don't let it fool you. Um, oops. This is actually Linux running off a USB. It doesn't need to be installed for you to use it. Which is one big cool thing about Linux. Sometimes I just run it on a computer so that I can look at the files that are already on it and do tests. So if we double click computer here, um, it should load up the file explorer and then I can see, oh, I've already got, you know, I've got a disk here that's got files on it. So let's go ahead with installing. Um, the monitor, can we make the screen a little bigger? Desktop settings, I would say. I'm not too sure. We've got a little Windows 7 like menu going here. It's pretty neat. I'm going to type in display and change the display settings to make the resolution a bit bigger. Um, I think it would be 1280 by. 
960 maybe. Yeah, it's decent enough. Could not set the configuration for a CRT 63. That's not good. Um, I don't know what that means though, and it doesn't seem to be causing any issues. Hang on, I have to shut my door since I'm streaming. You want to go out, cat? Yeah. One second. Okay, back again. So, we have to install Linux Mint. Let's double click install Linux Mint on the desktop. You may wish to read the release notes. Oh, we're already connected to the internet, um, which is great. That means we can open up Firefox and browse the web while we're installing, which is one good thing to do when you're installing Linux Mint, especially if you need help. Um, I think it also has hex chat, so you can chat with people on the internet. It's great. Um, so we're going to be going through the installer here. Let's test our keyboard layout. Let's go detect. Press one of the following keys. Um, y, W, no, that key is not on my keyboard. No, 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 no. I think that's the quote. So, uh, hmm. I don't think so. That seems like it's a key just for that. No, 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 no. And it detected as English US. Great. Let's continue on. Well, Firefox wants something, it's red. Um, install multimedia codecs. Yep, I guess we would want that. Probably always want that. A lot of Linux systems keep the codecs and stuff separately because they're, you know, kind of legal grade territory. Installer has detected the following disks have mounted partition. What does mounting mean? Um, mounting just means associating a um, hard disk space with an address on the computer. And in this case, um, that's because we have one for uh, the uh, volume that I've already got installed. So let's eject that and go yes. You don't need to eject it, but I just did that no reason. Um, install Linux Mint alongside Ubuntu. So you can actually install Linux aside another operating system like Windows. You don't have to override it. So let's do that. Um, you can specify how much space each one gets because it has to resize one. Um, it says, let's see, I guess it at minimum needs that. I can't really drag the, the divider here. Use the advanced partitioning tool. Um, and this is just regular partitioning in Linux. You can see all the partitions on the drive. Um, I think you'd have to add them yourself. FAT32, Ubuntu. Um, not too sure. Let's go back and we'll just go with the dual boot thing. If it can't drag it, there's probably a good reason for it. Yep, let's do that. And again, no draggy draggy. Yep, 
Let's write this to disk. An error happened. No. So what does that mean? I guess we have to go back. I guess we'll just override it all because I don't care. Could we get that error? Let's see, mint install, install a log. Do I enjoy installing Linux? Um, not really. Let's go erase disk and install mint. Let's check advanced features. We don't want to really encrypt it at this point. And let's go install now. Okay, so I just used Vim or tried to when it's not installed. So I think X session errors should have the errors that are containing the uh, petition thing. Not sure. I'm sure the logs are written somewhere. Let's drag this back up. Let's set me to live in Sydney because that's where I, my time zones are. Docs time? No. Your name? Uh, Jukia. Your computer's name? Jukia PC. Your username? Jukia. Your password? Uh, if you can guess what my password is, you will get... You will get a cookie. And we want to log in automatically because I'm lazy. And so it's installing now. In fact, it started installing um, during the time I was entering my you know time zone and username and stuff. And it shows us the applications we can use. Hey, so that's, yes, installing. So we have Skype, we have WhatsApp, we have a lot of cool stuff here, I think. So let's look around a little bit. Um, let's minimize the installer. Do you get a cookie? No. Um, as you can see, things are going to be a little bit laggy because it's installing, but let's check out um, Firefox. Let's look at the user guide for Linux Mint. On an actual system, it wouldn't be this laggy. It's just laggy because it's a virtual machine. Uh, and I haven't given it enough stuff. Installation guide, English. So we're at the install Linux Mint section. And hey, it takes us through all this. Select your time zone. Oh, they must have moved keyboard layout to the start. Um, enjoy your slideshow while Linux Mint is being installed. Uh, when it's finished, click restart now. Then what do we do? So we have to install drivers. Um, and it has a simple thing for driver manager there. Um, which is good compared to Windows, that's a lot less of a headache. Install multimedia stuff, language support, system snapshots, multi-boot, that's what we were trying to do. Always install Windows first. Fix the boot sequence using this if Windows overwrites it. That's pretty good to know. Then you install Steam, yeah, I suppose. I thought there would be a progress bar around here, but I guess not. 
Um, let's try and figure out if it's actually working by running system, I guess, monitor. It's like task monitor, I think, task manager. So we have all our processes. What's using the most CPU? Cinnamon. Uh, nothing else. What about disk write? Well, it's doing the most amount of disk writing. Ah, it doesn't say anything's really doing that. Let's look here. So CPU usage is pretty high. It's doing network stuff. Let's look at file systems. Um, looks like it's installing stuff. It's got 7.9 gigabytes in target. Wow, dad, you have two CPUs. Yeah. So what this is doing is just copying files. Um, so speaking of files, this is a computer and it has files. If you go to here, you have your files. Um, one interesting thing about Linux is that it's case sensitive. So you can create a folder named downloads with a capital D and then downloads with a lowercase d and they won't conflict. Um, it's a little bit jarring to get used to. Um, if you put a dot in front of a file name, uh, like a dot, and then you refresh the page or whatever, it disappears. You have to view hidden files to see all the hidden files. And in Linux, at least, hidden files are just things that begin with a dot. So that's the folder there. Um, now, if you go to the root directory, which is a bit like a C drive, this shows the entire system tree. Um, so we have home here and we have mint. That's where our files go. The rest of this is for the system. So if you poke around, you'll find some cool stuff. Um, if we go boot, it's going to have some Linux stuff there. CD-ROM, I think that's set to the USB flash drive. Yeah. Um, ATC has a whole bunch of files for configuring the system stuff. Um, lib and anything with an arrow is just a reference to somewhere else in the file system. Um, media is usually where other, other devices are put. So instead of having like an A drive and a C drive, um, devices just show up as folders. So you have media CD-ROM, media mint. Um, media mint isn't really anything that might be, um, the stuff that you do make changes to because this is read from a USB drive, but um, it will let you make changes and like install things, but you're still running from RAM, from memory. Uh, the mount directory, that's going to have more file systems. Um, I think it's loading, no. Audio is loading. It's always got the spinner because it's loading. Opt has, I don't know, people don't put stuff in opt. Run has temporary stuff. Yep, there we go. Run has temporary stuff. Um, so we have run. And then we have mount. Um, then we have run and we have run user. So if we go to run user 999, I guess we're user 999 and it has some stuff that runs at runtime. Uh, serve sys target. Target here refers to the target system that's being installed that's actually going on the VM. So as you can see, it's a bit different it's installing EFI and Grub stuff. Um, nothing's really mounted. It has home Jukia. I don't know if it's set that up yet, but the installer is 
editing the target system. That's pretty cool. Um, so let's close out. Let's look at some of the files that are installed, uh, programs that are installed. All applications, we have accessibility, account details, network settings, applets. I'll look at applets in a second. Backup tool, boot repair. Boot repair is good because you can just put this USB in and then run boot repair and repair your boot. Um, the installation is just finished. You can continue playing around, um, but your changes won't be saved. So let's continue testing for a little bit. Um, what else do we have here? Celluloid is a video player, Desklets, Disk Usage Analyzer, Document Viewer, Extensions. We'll look at some of that in a bit. We might as well just reboot now. What do we have at the left? We have Firefox, System Settings, kind of good stuff. Let's reboot and I'll uh, remove the USB in a second. Um, let's go to details and remove that. And we'll remove the USB thing. USB redirected to, I don't know if the USB thing is here. Um, USB, there we go. Let's remove this so it doesn't get passed through. Yep, remove that device, and then I will just... Yep, we remove the installation medium. And now let's eject it from the computer. We pressed enter. And I think it's going to reboot now. And then we can boot into our new Linux Mint system. Throw it in the garbage. No, I'm not going to do that. Is it not going to reboot? Okay, yeah. So I pressed... It, it didn't like me doing what I just did for some reason. Um, I guess it wasn't ready, but that's okay. It's just the installer. So let's shut down. Or is it shutting down? It might be shutting down. Let's force it off. And then run it again. I think that's only happening because I have a weird virtual machine set up. That's all. Um, because uh, this wasn't appeared as a USB drive. It appeared as like a hard drive. Anyway, we should now be able to boot. Shouldn't we? Oh. It didn't have a little boot logo, that's all. I was throwing off. And here we go. This is our new Linux Mint install. Uh, driver manager. And I have to put in my password to do things in Linux, which is kind of normal. Um, it's a bit like Windows Vista. Uh, what can we do? First steps. Let's change our colors. We're going to go with red because red is cool. Uh, can we change to dark mode, please? That'd be kind of cool. I don't like that. Panel layout, traditional. That's pretty cool. That's like the Windows XP I know. Um, let's see, there's modern, there's system snapshots. We're not going to use that. Um, that's like system restore. Driver manager, update manager. Let's install some updates, huh? Um, system settings and software manager and firewall. I think we should go to firewall as well. So we're doing some of the first steps of, uh, Linux. So we're going to enable the firewall by doing this. Firewall enabled. And then you can add some rules like uh, allow some programs in. 
that's network stuff. Let's do the update manager. Let's go OK. Uh, do I want to switch to a local mirror? Yeah. This is where it tries to find the fastest update server. Um, we'll go with AARnet. And for the Ubuntu mirror, because this is built on Ubuntu, we'll go with AAR in it again. And then we'll go OK. And it will update the software sources. And it's kind of worth pointing out now that most software that you're going to get in Linux is from these uh, resources. Uh, most of it is individually packaged by people. So you don't have to ever go to a website and download it from there. Um, and so we'll see that in a second. Um, you can add some additional stuff there, but we're not going to do that. A new version of the update manager is available. Let's apply the update. Big updates, yes. You can click show individual files here to have a look at what it's downloading. And then you can watch it install the stuff and it has all the stuff, all the messages. And look, we've got updates. That's pretty cool. We have all these updates. Updates are good in Linux, um, mainly because you don't have to really reboot your computer whenever there's an update. Um, with Windows, the system will often stop you from doing things if it's time to update. But I haven't seen any Linux systems do that, mainly because no one likes that. Anyway, let's go to backgrounds, have a look. There's some pretty cool backgrounds here. I like the existing one. Um, effects, window effects. So I guess that's like fades and stuff. Little transitions and stuff. You can turn these off. Themes. Let's look at some themes. And so the theme manager is a lot different to the mate one. Um, because you have all this here. Let's go add remove themes. And I guess you can just install themes straight from here instead of having to go through a website. That's pretty cool. Let's search up Windows. Windows 10 light theme. Let's install that. Um, then let's set it, I guess. Uh, what's this? More info. Can I right click set it? I guess not. More info just brings up info about it. So let's set the window borders to Windows 10. Do we have Windows icons? Doesn't look like it. That's okay. Controls. Windows 10. Mouse pointer. I guess we'll keep it with how it is. And desktop. Do we have the Windows 10 desktop there? Here we go. And it's just like Windows 10, but not really. So what else do we have? Um, that was the settings. No, it wasn't. That was just some settings. Um, applets. I haven't seen applets before. What are applets? How do I use them? Are these the things that are on the taskbar? Um, let's see. 
If you give me a real rabbit, if I give you a real rabbit, will you show it? Yes. So if I remove the window list applet. Oh, so these are all the applets and stuff. And I can restore the defaults. And let's put it back to, I think, how it tends to work. But I set it because I, I don't want these uh, window icons. So let's see if we can get rid of that. Um, would it be in grouped window list? Can we drag these applets around? Um, and it has some settings for that. Oh, it's like right to left. That's a little strange. Um, can we drag it? Not too sure. If I spent more time than none at all, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to figure this out. But I'm sure there's also a button for us to set it in system settings. So I think it would be in themes, maybe. Show icons in menus, show icons on buttons. No, probably not here. You know what, let's change the font size. Can we do that? That seems like something you would want to do on a computer. So let's see. I don't think it would be in this part of the themes. Uh, font selection. Text scaling factor. Nice. Why do I have little baby eyes? I don't know. Bigger fonts are always better. Um, applets. What are applets? No, we've just been to applets. Um, we're looking at desklets. It's got a digital photo frame. We don't have any photos though. Um, pictures, I guess. We might have to get some stuff there. Oh, we can move stuff by right clicking. Preferences. Conf uh, I guess we have to right click here. Move. Select a new position of the panel. Okay, just do that. Escape to cancel. I don't know. What's this here? Can I remove that? Oh, I deleted my panel. And it tells me to open the panel settings. Add new panel. Oh no, I think I really messed up my system. What the hell is happening? Um, uh -oh. How do I reset the panel? Help. I might have to... Oh, panel edit mode? Is that what's happening? Do I want to delete this? What is happening? I've, I've ruined my computer, I'm sorry. Um, ask DuckDuckGo. Oh, the menu doesn't even work. Or is it in like the panel mode? Um, the panel does not even work. Troubleshoot. Help me. Help me reset. Restart Cinnamon. Okay, that seems to have helped. Um, panel settings. 
it's telling me I don't have drivers installed, but that's okay. I'm using a virtual machine. Um, let's go back and let's, let's figure out how to get out of this situation we've put ourselves in. Let's go to the internet, Firefox. And we're just going to ask DuckDuckGo. I don't know what a colorway is. Uh, we're going to search Yahoo, Mint Reset Panel. Um, let's see. Let's go to the first one. Six years ago. So we have to run this in a, a terminal. Let's see. Paste. Oh, that worked. Um, mint set panel type. How to configure the bottom panel. Um, super key panel, auto hide panel, customize. I guess we should go back to like the, the welcome program. Welcome screen. Can I set it there? Oops, I clicked modern. There we go. We did it. Reboot required. Now it probably says that because I have a terminal, uh, a kernel update, but that's okay. I will reboot it later. Some system reports require my attention. What are these? I don't need language packs. And I don't need to set up system restore utilities on a VM. I would in if it was a real machine. Um, and so let's go to system settings and see what else we can mark up for now. Um, languages, hot corners, input methods, extensions. I have to download some, I guess. Transparent panels, undecorate, place a watermark, tile your windows, the cube. The desktop cube. We need it. So I guess that'll happen when we switch workspaces. Wobbly windows. Sanitize X session errors. Um How do we use wobbly windows? I guess we might need graphics drivers installed for that. Um, let's add something to the panel. Panel edit mode. Um, applets. And we're going to add a workspace switcher. Um, this is kind of maybe a boomer thing, but I use workspaces in Linux. Let's turn off edit mode. And that just means you can, oops. No, I don't want a new panel. That just means you can change between different workspaces where you can have different applications open. It's incredibly useful. So you can switch using the keyboard, things like that. On my actual computer that I'm using right now, I have like 20 workspaces and I don't even like, I have one, uh, when you don't have two monitors. Yeah. But I have, yeah, 20. Let me count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven ones that are always open. Then I have up to nine ones that I can use. What are in them? 
I basically just group applications and then have those instead of like minimizing them, I just switch between workspaces. What? What's the issue? I don't want to minimize stuff or drag them around my screen. Anyway, can we use the cube? I don't see any cube here. You've never used a workspace? Well, you're missing out, I have to say. What else can we do? I'm sure if I searched up how to fix it, I'd find it. But I'm pretty sure it's because I don't have like graphics drivers installed because this is a virtual machine. Um, which is good. It's good that it works without graphics drivers because otherwise it would suck really bad. Um, startup applications, screensavers. Do we have any cool screensavers? Uh, screensaver. I guess not. That's a little bit sad. I want a screensaver though. Exfus has cool screensavers, yeah. Um, so... How do we lock the screen? Search up Linux Mint screensavers. How do we fix this problem of not having good screensavers? I must know. Screensaver? They were removed from the default, from the default one. That sucks, but someone says you can install a different screensaver. So let's copy that. Let's paste that in, enter my password. Yes, I would like to install that. And then it says, disable the built-in screensaver. Um, I guess never. So let's see how this goes. Yep, I guess I have to launch it. And then it has a whole bunch of screensavers, I think. Lock screen after whatever. So I guess I have to disable the mint, the cinnamon screensaver stuff. Screensaver cinnamon settings. That's nice here when it's, when there's two things with the same name, it tells you which one it is in the menu. So let's disable all this. And I guess we can go lock screen now. And do we have screensavers? Yeah. I'm not sure if it will happen automatically if when I, when I boot up, let's see, auto start, startup applications. Does it start X screensaver? Not sure. Hmm. Linux Mint X screensaver. Support for NVIDIA Prime. What's that? So here's a guide on installing it. So we have to start it at login. 
and we have to run X screensaver. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. You know, let's restart the computer real quick. Or, I guess, log out, then log in. So, log out. And then we'll see if screensaver is installed. How do we disable the check your video drivers check? Oops, I keep typing in the wrong password. So Linux Mint, disable um, driver message. Let me go to the first link. Um, people are arguing. Someone's dug into the code and the solution to is, is to enable 3D acceleration. So let's see what another solution is. It says we're becoming, it's running in a VM. The recommended fixes were to install the guest edition stuff. Someone has a solution here. So we run this code here in a terminal. And then I guess we log in and log out. And we also check if we want to do the screensaver. Like, does the screensaver work? Doesn't seem to be running. So let's grab that error message and search it up. X screensaver daemon not running. And I guess we should put Linux Mint after it. You have to add it to a startup thing. So we're going to run this command at startup. Neat. So custom command. Uh, I'll just put screensaver, next screensaver, no splash, add. And now let's log out and log back in. And we'll see what happens. Seems like it's all working. We don't have that message come up anymore. And the screensaver thing works. That's pretty cool, right? Um, really happy about that. I didn't have to dig into anything to figure that out. I just had to look for some solutions on the internet. And I search some like basic stuff. And you just keep doing that. And usually there's a solution, even if it's like a, a kind of a weird one that people have. So let's see, what else do we have? Windows, workspaces, Button layout, right, left, GNOME, classic Mac. Oh yeah, you can change your button layout. Behavior. Unless you're trying to get Tux Math to run on Arch, then you're screwed. Yeah. Um, hardware, color, disks, graphic tablet, keyboard, all that. Um, so let's try and install something. Let's try installing TuxMath. So how do we do that? Um, you might usually just search up like, the way you usually install stuff is by searching it in Google and then downloading it there. So let's try that. 
Tuxmath. Is there a Tuxmath website? There's a GitHub. Is that part of it? C docs slash readme. Okay. So Tuxmath seems like it doesn't actually have a uh, package to install it for Linux straight from like the internet. Oh, you've got a URL. All right. So let's search up tuxforkids.com. Mm -hmm. Tuxmath. So how do we install this? Linux RPM. And this is not going to work on this system because Linux Mint doesn't read RPMs. But this is the wrong way to install it anyway. The correct way is to go to the software manager and search for it. So if we search up Tuxmath and we wait for it to search, which is taking a little bit, but that's okay. Tuxmath. And we have two of them here. Tux of math command. And this is a flat pack. And then we have Tux math, which is not a flat pack. That's pretty cool. Um, so what versions are they? This is version 2.0.3. And this is not sure. Didn't even think to look at flat packs. Flat packs are really good, and I'll actually show you why. I'll show you why right now. Because if we go to Linux Mint comes with flat packs, but if we search up FlatHub, this is like a kind of recent development in the Linux community, but this is like a kind of list of packages that people have made. Um, that works on any system that supports Flatpak. So if we search up TuxMath and we click here, then we click install, then we click OK, then it takes us back to here and then it installs it, I think. I think that's what it's doing. Please be patient, this can take some time. Does this have a version? 2.0.3. Uh, let's go back here and let's go install. And it tells us the stuff it's going to install because it's a flat pack. It has a whole bunch of stuff, 758 megabytes. But we'll just install that now. Um, it's only like the first, uh, it's only like the first install that's big. Um, an alternate though is an app image. So if we go to LibreOffice, or what's a smaller program? A program I use often is called Lossless Cut. This is a very good program. Um, I don't know why they have a picture of Ronald Reagan there. That's okay. Um, and so you can download it from Snap or, uh, I don't think it's on Flatpak. Let's search up Flatpak lossless cut. It's the implication. Clearlinux.org slash software slash lossless cut. Let's check if it's actually in the repositories here. Lossless cut. Yes, it is, and it is as a flat pack. Nice. 
But say it doesn't have a flat pack. Uh, it might provide an app image. And these are the closest things you're going to get on Linux for like exe files that you can just download and run. Um, OBS has a flat pack, which is what I use. Um, I'm using it right now actually to stream because it has the browser plugin while the one in Arch Linux doesn't. So let's download the app image, which again is pretty big. Um, I don't want lossless cut there, but let's search up, I don't know, Tux. It might have Tux Racer. Um, Tux Math, let's install it again. Let's install the version that isn't flat pack or app image, and you can see it's 11 megabytes, so let's install that. You'll see you'll need a password to install it, I think, which is the main difference, well, I guess in Linux Mint, between these. Let's see what we're downloading. It's downloading those. And we've downloaded the app image. So let's go, fixing your Tux math issue and no, in no time flat. Let's try running this. Oh, it has no programs associated with it. So the trick is that you have to right click on the app image and go properties and permissions and then allow executing it. And then you can double click it and it will run. I think, yeah. I don't know why Linux systems don't automatically do that for .app images, but there you go. I downloaded app image and it was fine. And we downloaded TuxMath. I think this is the, yeah, not the flat pack one, but this is the regular one. Oh boy, all right. We're not gonna do this. And then we also have the flat pack version, which is TuxMath flat pack. And it's all good. And for the most part, that's how you install things in Linux. Um, and that's about it, really. I think that's basically everything to Linux for the most part. Um, at least this Linux. That's how you do things in this Linux. Um, I guess we can talk about Wine. If you run, if you install Wine, you can run some Windows programs, but I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, you can. You can install Steam. All that stuff. But that's about everything, I think. Do we have any other Linux distributions we want to think about? Um, I don't think so. I mean, let's clear the list of recent files. Arch proper. Yeah, so Arch has... Oh, internet web apps run websites as if they were apps. What's this? What's the website for this? Linux Mint Web App Manager. Neat. But this is the typical Linux desktop at the moment. On some distributions, you'll have to install Flatpak. Um, some you have to install a lot more stuff, but it's a whole bun bunch of disjoint applications from different vendors. So TuxMath it's from random places, LibreOffice from somewhere else, Internet, we have Firefox, you can get Chrome or Chromium, HexChat, and you can customize this for the most part to what you need, which is what I think the power of having uh, a good amount of ownership over software 
as a uh, society. And it's free. So it's not really much excuse not to try Linux, is there? Um, you don't need to try it on a desktop. That's the example I have here. You wish Google would claim ownership over you? <laughs> yeah. Um, but really, I think that's it. I think this kind of explains well what I like about Linux and why you should try using Linux and why you should stop putting links in my chat. What is that? That's a bunny. Okay. Um, and I think that's the end of the stream, unless we're just going to... No, that's the end of the stream. We're ending it now. Oh, hey, young Zenikuta. Am I Australian? Yes, I'm Australian. Wow, rude. Couldn't be you? Why? Imagine... Imagine being Australian, or well, what are you? See you in the server. Wow, nagging me in chat without even getting nagged yourself. Do I kiss snakes? No, this is getting out of control. So I'm gonna wrap it up and uh, what we might actually do, just to assure people, because it looks like I kind of wiped my DOS installation so we're just actually going to close the VM, go to snapshots, and then we're going to add mint as the snapshot. And then we're going to, I guess, start the pre-stream snapshot. And we'll get back to the uh, DOS mutt programming next week. This is another good reason I like VMs because you can create snapshots. Um, and yeah, even though this is Ubuntu, it's basically the same thing. You just have a little different menu, um, a little different software stuff. It's based on GNOME, but you know, if we search up TuxMath here, I don't think it's actually in Ubuntu. I'm not sure. This looks like the flat pack. That's fine. Okay, everyone. I'll see you later.